Well, hello and welcome to Digital Marketing Musings, hosted by Merkel. Each episode, we choose a different expert to share the latest and greatest in digital marketing trends. Today, we are interviewing Mike Liu and Kevin Viatoro about NFTs. Let's get to it. I'm Gaia Reed. And I'm Andrea McCartney. And this is Digital Marketing Musings. Welcome back to Digital Marketing Musings, Season 2. Today, we're joined by Mike and Kevin to talk about NFTs. Mike Liu is the head of innovation for Dentsu Media, focused on many of the Kara clients currently. His role is to help brands anticipate and plan for their future consumers, including those around Metaverse and Web3. Kevin Viatoro works in global partnerships at Dentsu and has over 10 years of digital media strategy and activation experience. He is a Web3 subject matter expert, having created and sold hundreds of NFTs himself. Welcome to our show, Mike and Kevin. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, guys. <laughs> We're super excited. And as a prequel, uh, this episode continues our gaming series. Today, we're talking about NFTs. What are they? Why marketers and brands should care about them and how they're affecting the digital marketing landscape today. So starting from the very beginning, can you all describe for us what is an NFT and why are they such a big part of the Metaverse Web3 conversation? Yeah, I can take this one, Gaia. So when we're talking about the Metaverse, I think it's good to point out initially that the Metaverse isn't here quite yet, right? Like a lot of people talk about the Metaverse in the news. They're talking about what it's going to be like, but it's exactly that. We don't really know what it's going to be like. We're building it right now. So many folks believe that NFTs will be a big component of it. And so there's a cake analogy I like to use. And the base of this cake is made up of blockchain. That's the underlining tech. And then the next layer is tokenization. NFTs, cryptocurrencies, things like that. That's the value exchange. And then finally, the, the last layer is the metaverse itself. So this is the experience layer. This is where we will go with our AR or VR headsets. Uh, we'll go play games, we'll go socialize, we'll be in conference rooms, things like that. So you can think of NFTs almost as like the, the value exchange method for, for making the metaverse uh, a true reality later down the line. But again, it's not here yet. We're still building it. Just to, just to kind of add on to that. So as, as Kevin illustrated, I guess this layer cake, right? That middle section of NFTs and the way that we're sort of thinking about it here and the way that the industry is sort of moving into the NFT industry is like, these are the digital assets that we can own, right? And so whether it's artwork or artifacts inside of a game, or artifacts inside of a virtual platform, um, because it is underpinned by blockchain technology, these NFTs allow us to claim provenance and claim ownership of uh, digital goods. Whereas previously it was, you, you couldn't do that because like a centralized entity, whether it's like the game maker or the social platform owned everything, um, but now since it's decentralized on the blockchain um, in terms of having this ledger of showing who owns what, um, the NFT is really just that that token to say, hey, I own you know, this outfit online or I own this piece of artwork. Or I own um, access to X, Y, and Z because I, I have this token in my wallet. So you know, when we talk about NFTs, it has multiple, multiple use cases outside of just art, um, which I think is the probably the most popular use case that people know it as. But... Um, it, it spans so beyond, uh, much more beyond sort of uh, a visual aspect to it. And it's like the underlining technology behind the smart contract of what it unlocks. Yeah, those are great points, Mike. I think when it comes to NFTs as well, you mentioned ownership is a big uh, aspect and, and, and really big value prop of NFTs. Absolutely. So NFTs are definitely unique digital ownership that's transferable, in my opinion, uh, because it's it's made in the underlining tech to be uh, as transparent as possible. So the ownership is tracked on the blockchain, which provides like a neutral and unbiased confirmation of ownership. Anyone can look on the blockchain and figure out who owns what, who owns what NFT, who owns it uh, two days ago, who owns it now, uh, things like that. So these NFTs can be transferred theoretically from one universe to the next, creating this metaverse. And that is the hopes and visions of all the people building this behind the scenes right now. What do you, what do you mean by universe? Do you mind like kind of going into what you just said? Yeah, absolutely. So like a metaverse is just multiple universes, right? 
if you think about like the Marvel universe, the DC universe, different things like that, the metaverse might bridge <laughs> these all together at one point in time. Uh, you could have uh, a Lego universe and then it's bridged with, you know, uh, the Marvel universe and it's, it could be like a, a, a mix mash. Uh, you could have uh, a Nike land universe and then that bridges into an Adidas uh, type of universe. Uh, so yeah, I, when I think of metaverse, I just think of multiple different worlds, different universes uh, being connected in, in one space. Uh, whether that be through NFTs, through blockchain is yet to be determined, but that seems like the most viable tech at this point. And we threw out a bunch of definitions that you guys put in there just to make sure I and our listeners fully understand it. Cause I know this is a, an interesting concept to grasp. Say I'm in one of these universes or metaverse and I purchase a digital good. So say it's a piece of art and I purchase it using cryptocurrency. And so uh, the blockchain is like the ledger saying, okay, Gaia, bought this piece of art. The NFT itself, it's the token just that I kind of like have with my avatar saying that I own it. Like what exactly is the NFT when we're talking about it? Is it the art itself? Is it like a token of the art? Yeah, there's a there's a couple ways to think about it. So currently there's a lot of NFTs out there and artwork that's not actually on the blockchain, right? They're like off-chain art, right? So Mm -hmm. um, it could be a really robust image or video or something like that, but it's hosted on another server and it could be a decentralized server like IPFS or something like that, um, in which the NFT that you've purchased is the contract that kind of points to that server and says you own this and it kind of resolves that, right? On-chain art is something that's actually pretty cool, very special. Obviously, it has to be very, very low in, in file size, just given that it has to fit on the blockchain. But there are a lot of projects like Art Blocks mm-hmm. out there that that pretty much create art based off of a transaction number or um, an algorithm that when you mint it, it kind of creates these like bits and dots, and it has like these colors in it. And so um, it might look digitized or like some sort of digital art, but it's really special because it's on-chain. So that actually if a server went down or anything like that, like it would not be destroyed because it is on the blockchain. It is, it is on-chain art. Um, so that NFT is probably valued even more so than an NFT that's pointing to a certain server that says like this artwork is yours. And you also referenced smart contract. Can you talk about first what a smart contract is and how it fits into that definition? Yeah, I can jump in for that one. A, a smart contract is essentially just some code in the background saying who who owns what, and also it has a set of rules attached to it. That's really all it is. Uh, so whenever you mint an okay. NFT, there's a smart contract behind the scenes saying this is how much it's going to cost. Uh, this is what you're getting, right? This is this is uh, the piece of code linking to that artwork that Mike talked about, and you know where that's hosted mm-hmm. is is a, another conversation point. But it, it's typically hosted to an image or a video or uh, some sort of uh, uh, media that you can access online. And so whenever you mint, you interact with a smart contract. And then that's really like the the technology that Ethereum brought to the the cryptocurrency game that changed everything. Because before Ethereum, there was no smart contracts tied to blockchain. But all of a sudden, you have these smart contracts tied to, uh, it could be Ethereum, or it could be any other cryptocurrency. Uh, that has smart contract capabilities. Uh, But once you have this tech and once you're able to utilize it, then you sort of have this unbiased opinion, right? It's not even an opinion at that point. It's a fact. You have this unbiased fact and proof of record that you can can easily access. You can look at it anytime to figure out, okay, this person owns this, this person owns that. Uh, This is where it was transferred. Like I was mentioning earlier, two days ago, two weeks ago, two years ago, there's a paper trail with all of that stuff. Uh, so for better or for worse, uh, everything that you do uh, when it comes to blockchains are completely transparent, uh, with a few exception of some privacy blockchains. Yeah. And then as Kevin said, like there's a set of rules. So once that smart contract is executed, it could say, do X, Y, and Z afterwards. And because it's already programmed in there, 
like today, if, if you were to sign a contract then you'd have to like give it to a notary or like you have to give it to solve all these other people get the paper pushed around and, and then somebody has to approve it and there's all these gate holds in place, but a smart contract, since you program it in a certain way, mm-hmm. once you either purchase it or something happens to that contract that triggers an, an event, then that's the, that opens up this waterfall of events, right? So if it is, if this contract is purchased, then cut X percent out to the originator of that con of this, of this contract or this piece of art to the original owner, right? And it goes straight to that wallet. So all these things have to happen without someone manually saying, oh, okay, cool. You get the royalties of 5% in perpetuity. Cool. If I sell this and I'm going to cut out 5% and give it to you, no, this all happens um, automatically. And so that is the beauty of a smart contract and the underpinning of these NFTs, right? So if you think about all these things that are unlocking the potential of X, Y, and Z, whether it's new businesses or new revenue models or new business models in general, um, it's all because you have all these different ways to generate income, um, tie things together, have digital assets being transferred, have royalties being passed back. So it's a pretty exciting space in general because of the smart contract capability here, because you could you know, program it in any which way you want. Yeah, artists are loving this idea. So if I'm an artist and I sell a piece of artwork to Mike, and then Mike then sells that same artwork to someone else, and then the smart contract, I specify at a royalty amount, then I get a commission of that sale he made to the third party. Uh, so it could be anywhere from five to 10% is typically the range of, of these royalties, but it could be much higher or much lower based on what you're selling and how frequently you expect that asset to be traded. So the originator really gets to take advantage of like this secondary market all the, t- all the way down every single other transaction, if that's included in the smart contract. Yeah, big time. So you can imagine if, if I'm just, you know, an up and coming artist and I don't have to pay a gallery for commissions, like that makes me really excited. Or if I'm a musician and I put out a hip hop record or, or song or single or whatever, and then all of a sudden people are trading that NFT and selling it and buying it and I'm getting royalties on the back end without a record label. That's very exciting to me. (laughs) Well, especially for companies like Nike, who make a physical good in the real world, say they, you know, make an NFT of some sneakers. Um, You know, if I buy sneakers in the real world, and then I wear them, and then I sell them on eBay, like Nike will never get anything past the original cost of that good. But then they can price it into their smart contract to continue getting a percentage of sales of an NFT of Nike's like indefinitely plus like it's probably way more profitable than actually making a physical good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. yeah. I think the cool thing there, like if you, their patents too, I think it was like crypto kicks was like their first one that they issued, but it was sort of this whole, I think people were just kind of speculating on what that meant, but having NFTs of certain shoes and then having those shoes, like if you forge them together or merge them together, they might birth other types of sneakers that don't exist. Um, so you can think of how mm. cool it is just as a, as a sneaker collector or someone who's really into shoes to be able to, you know, take these NFTs and gamify it in a sense to say, oh, I'm going to create completely different looking shoes. If I put this colorway and this colorway together, it might spit out something that Nike's never made. And then perhaps Nike opens it up and says, cool, if you've got X amount of, NFTs of ours and this many tokens of ours, um, we will actually make you that one-on-one sneaker since you have in your NFT. And that's sort of like a loyalty play. So to, to push more into their digital asset game, which can net them so much money on much higher margin than a physical shoe. You know, I think there's something like gamification uh, that you can actually spin it out and make it, you know, something that your fans would really love. So as we've been talking about this, I've been wondering like how do we quantify the value of an nft and we've talked about it pretty thoroughly in the like the context of like art um but just in a digital medium and and so i guess what i'm getting at is like how much is an nft worth and like how do we come to that decision of what the value is yeah right now it really depends on how much the market is willing to pay for an nft so this could be related to a speculative type of buying right maybe someone thinks that the artwork or the song or whatever they're buying at the moment will rise over time. And some NFTs are are priced Mm. like artwork, right? Um, Prices rise and fall based on the most recent transaction volume, recent buys, how much someone's willing to pay for it. Where other NFTs are valued based on their current future utility. 
so there's definitely the art side of NFTs, but there's also the utility component of NFTs as well. Is this creating real world value for me? Um, it might, it might not. Uh, maybe it does right. now, uh, but maybe it will later. And that could also be a factor in how much someone is willing to pay for an NFT. Yeah. Even like certain NFTs tied to physical goods, you know, there's a lot of liquor brands who have had rare whiskeys or rare, rare um, casks of, of a certain liquor that they sell. And they sort of tokenize it by associating one bottle of this rare whiskey or rare liquor to an NFT in which they mm-hmm. will say people can kind of trade that as they want. Right. And then it's only when you redeem it or burn the NFT that you can actually have the physical one. Um, you know, I think Glenn Levitt did something mm-hmm. where they had $18,000 for that, or sorry, it was like an 18, was an 18 year old or $18,000. Kev, do you remember? I don't remember that. It was one that of those. Of it. That it sounds like some expensive. delicious whiskey. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would it was, say either. It was, it was a very rare whiskey. Uh, either one. Yeah. But either or, right. So they, it was a very expensive one, but you know, with whiskey right. collecting or liquor collecting, you sometimes have to incur costs like shipping it right properly especially it's like a four-year-old bottle or something like that right and you have to have the right temperature to have in your house and the right refrigerator and storing methods so these liquor companies are saying okay we'll hold it in this vault for you until you're ready to to actually drink it and so they're taking on those costs at the Mm -hmm. same time they're creating a market and connecting with other uh liquor collectors or spirits collectors right so now if kevin's like oh i actually want that i had it before it's my favorite and um, I'll pay you a 30% premium over it. I just sell it to them as an NFT. And so now he has rights to that whatever is in that vault. So, you know, it could be something like art or it could be something that just unlocks something in the future. And as the older that that cask goes or that spirit ages, perhaps it's worth even more. So that NFT will start to appreciate in price respective to what the mm-hmm. physical one would go. So there's like the digital aspect of it. There's the physical aspect of it. You know, how much value do you put on it? Um, you know, for a certain experience. Right. Yeah. That's a really good example that I hadn't uh, heard before. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, physical real world examples that are popping up almost every week. It seems like, I mean, there's new F- NFTs dropping constantly, but some of my favorite real world right. life uh, redemption uh, models that have been executed in the past was from Coachella. So they released like a very limited set of NFTs. And if you hold it, if you held one of these NFTs that are like super limited edition, you get VIP access to life, to the festival in real life. So that has like very real substantial okay. value. Awesome. <laughs> and NBA Top, Top yeah. Shop did something similar where if you hold one of their NFTs, you get access to the NBA All-Star Games. Uh, so these are real life events. And the list goes on okay. with, with different types of musicians. And actually one of my friends is a part of a, a project that represents Method Man. And Method Man is like really big into working out these days. The guy is swole. He's huge. And so if you hold one of his <laughs> NFTs, you get to actually have a personal training session with a method man and get to go to his shows and get that uh, exclusive access to an artist that, that you respect and that you appreciate. So there's a lot of like real world benefits behind NFTs, depending on the project that you look at. It seems like this has just kind of opened up a, a very creative free for all for, for brands and um, individuals to just kind of monetize like any sort of experience that they want that didn't really feel like it was possible before. Yeah, absolutely. And it's almost a way for brands and artists to move their friends from being just spectators to participants, right? It's, it's almost a way to engage mm-hmm. these fans a step further and provide real world value to some of like the super fans out there or someone who thinks that they might be um, you know, more of a fan that wants more out of, out of, uh, you know, a sports team or um, uh, access to a musician that they respect, or maybe just wants to go to a festival and, and hang out with other people that are also VIPs, right? It almost turns into this exclusive club. It seems like from all the examples you guys are, are citing, is our expectation of like what best practice or best in class looks like in this space something that really intertwines value in the real world and in the digital world together? Um, or, or what do you think best in class really looks like? I think it depends what you're trying to sell. What would you say, Mike? Yeah, I think, I mean, I'd say there's, there's examples of both. I personally enjoy the, the merging of IRL and URL. 
And any time that an NFT can be a conduit to unlock something to enhance your experience in IRL, um, as well as like what you're doing online is is like is great, right? I, I would highly suggest that, especially if brands are looking to get into the space, like what are the assets and access points that you have at to, that you have on your roster that you can offer as some sort of benefit or utility or some sort of community building thing that people don't have access to ex- outside of your brand allowing them inside there. As Kevin was saying, this is like a big community play and, and somewhere for, for fans to really enjoy um, and to win, right? So if, if your fans are winning or your consumers are winning and they feel special and at the same time, they're spending more time with your brand than another competitor or any other brand, like that's that's great. So whether that's targeting people who spend most of their life online or in game or exploring in social platforms that are um, connected to the internet then perhaps a digital experience makes sense for them. Maybe gifting them something that, or selling NFTs that make their their avatars look a certain way or, or give them access to certain areas that might um, be exclusive for, for some, but not for them. Or um, even in the real world stuff, like Nike is such a great example there because they're sort of playing in between both and their acquisition of Artifact is just, um, you know, I'm just super excited to see what they do with it, right? Because Artifact sort of can can still op- operate independently, uh, which is the, if you don't know, the Artifact is the NFT company or the Web3 company, I should say, that uh, Nike acquired and stylized RTF, RTFKT, Artifact, right? RTFKT, right? So Artifact, like, that's great. Like, they can create their digital artifacts and they can create their digital assets that people can trade, has as avatars, and then maybe eventually in the future, you can start to use that avatar across different platforms, or you can have that avatar be projected as, as augmented reality on your body if someone's looking at you through this webcam, um, or through smart contacts or glass, like whatever that is. But like that blending is kind of makes it more special and cool to me. Um, and that's a win is if you can kind of give um, special access or more community building um, excitement to people who are fans of your brand. So how can brands extract value from NFTs? Like Mike was mentioning, it really comes back to community. And if you think about what community means for a big brand, that's a customer. That's a loyal customer base. So how can I create a customer that becomes an advocate and a loyalist, right? We want that person to evangelize our products and bring in more people. So how do I do that? Well, I can get them excited about something. And maybe that's through exclusive perks. Maybe that's through, uh, you know, uh, a VIP reward program, right? That's not available to anyone. Maybe you can only be a part of this like amazing reward program if you hold a, a NFT. Um, but if this person right. has that access and receives uh, those incentives, then you know this person's going to talk about their experience with their friends, their family members, and all that. So they will become the the brand advocate and evangelist which I think as any brand knows is invaluable. So kind of switching gears a little bit and this kind of, I guess, sticking on topic with the valuation of NFTs, given the recent frenzy around production and purchasing, it seems like every celebrity or brand has their own line of NFTs rolling out or coming out soon. Do we feel like this is like a bubble sort of situation or like, what are your thoughts on that? Are we in a car bubble? Are we in a housing market bubble? We don't really know, right? No one, <laughs> I, no one can answer that. Very valid questions. Yeah. Yes. So I, I would, I would right. definitely repeat that uh, sort of uh, thinking and mindset when we're talking about NFTs and crypto being a bubble. Uh, no one really knows, and if they claim that they know, that okay. they do not trust that person. <laughs> they are trying to sell you <laughs> snake oil. Uh, but seriously, uh, when it comes down to <laughs> their, their crystal ball, isn't accurate. Yeah, the, the crystal ball is a little cloudy on their part. Uh, but when it comes down to <laughs> you know predicting if, if things are overpriced or not, it's really hard to say until after the fact. Like if, if you would have told me that right. board apes are worth as much as they are, hundreds of thousand dollars a piece, uh, back when I could have bought one for like less than a thousand bucks, I still would have thought you were insane <laughs> if someone would have told me that. <laughs> fair, very fair. And so we already talked a little bit about you know, how we pay for NFTs with cryptocurrency on blockchain technology. For individuals who are new to these technologies, they're still like very new to most of um, most consumers and, and a lot of brands. 
what are things that are important to know when when looking to purchase an NFT? Do your research. Do do your due diligence and research. There's so many there's so many scams out there and that's just like with any any industry that is burgeoning or any industry that has money, there's always opportunistic people who are very malicious and um, just mean spirited to say the least, who are just trying to get people to um, have a sense of FOMO, try to buy something and pretty much like steal all their money. So I will say like, you know, do your due diligence, how I got in the space. I read a lot about it. Um, I watched a lot of videos on YouTube on how to do X, Y, and Z, how to open up a wallet, how to transfer crypto there. Um, this is before that, you know, MetaMask now has an, uh, an Apple Pay um, integration. So now you can open up a MetaMask wallet, which is probably one of the most popular wallets out there uh, for NFT holders and people who just transact in Web3 as a non-custodial wallet. Um, you have to understand that if you get a non-custodial wallet like a MetaMask, you are responsible for that wallet. You are responsible for the passwords. Do not write that digitally. Do not email it to yourself. You have to write it down on a piece of paper because if it gets hacked, then somebody will have access to your wallet. Um, there are people that we know that have that's happened to before. So just be careful with that. You are, you know, you're on the hook. There's nobody to say forgot password on these types of things. And who knows? Maybe maybe you should just stay with like a Coinbase wallet or something like that, where there is a custodian. There's somebody who can reset your password for you if you need to. To hold cryptocurrency, you know, I don't know if that's going to work for their NFT marketplace as well. But uh, I would say like the most important thing is just don't jump into this thinking that, you know, you're going to make a lot of money or it's just like something that, you know, you hear all these great stories of like 10 year olds who made millions of dollars on an NFT, you know, project. Yes, these things happen. And, and that's why I think that's why you ask the question if there's a bubble, because they have so many stories like that that sensationalize these things. And then you just look, kind of look out there and there's just a bunch of crap out there, too. But I think that's just with any, any industry, you'll, you'll see a high influx of stuff. That, but that won't determine whether or not like it's a valid space or not, right? If anything, it just shows that there's a lot more energy and there's a lot more, you know, effort getting put into this to the development and the success of it. So my number one advice would be do your research, do it well, make sure you're doing it right. And if you need help, just reach out, you know, you can reach out to Kevin or I, we're, we're happy to onboard we're here for you. you. Yeah, we're here for you. <laughs> send you documentation, whatever that, whatever that is. But um, it's very imperative to understand that when you go into a decentralized world like blockchains, um, you have to understand that there is no centralized uh, entity to help help you out if, if you lose your password or something like that. So there are things like Coinbase that will have custodial um, help around your wallet. But you know when you start going out on your own, you, you're sort of on your own there. Anything to add? Oh, absolutely. We could talk about this for hours, but I just want to unpackage. Mike mentioned custodial a few times. Uh, so for people listening who might not know what that means, that's essentially a website, uh, a service, an exchange like Coinbase, like Binance, where you can go. And if there's issues, you know, they can retrieve your password and, and recover your funds. Uh, but if it's not a custodian, then that means you are in charge of your own destiny. So if you lose the private keys to the wallet that you just created on MetaMask because you just bought an NFT, if you lose those keys, then you're not getting that NFT back ever again. Uh, so there's certain best practices uh, you, can, you can use to make sure that you have the private key written in a safe place. There's things like hardware wallets that, that are very secure and, and help you keep your NFTs and crypto very secure offline that a lot of people use. It's kind of like putting in a, a, a bank vault somewhere, you know, it, it's out of harm's way, you know, it's safe. Uh, but there is a big responsibility factor uh, going into this. And whenever you're spending money, uh, you need to be responsible in general. But when you are your own bank, and that's what cryptocurrency aims to, to create, uh, when you are your own bank, you just need to up the notch of, of that responsibility level, just, a, just a, another, another notch, or just a little bit, right? Because now all of a sudden, you have a lot more on the line. And I think if people have that mindset and, and go into buying NFTs or crypto with that mindset, I think they'll do great. Uh, but a lot of people don't realize that they need to take that responsibility going into it. And that's when you read those articles about people who lost like, you know, $5 million worth of Dogecoin in, in a hardware wallet or not a hardware wallet, like a hard drive somewhere in a landfill and they can't get it out or they, they don't know what happened to their password to get that, you know, 20 Bitcoin out of 
out of uh, some wallet that they can see, but they can't access because it's it's a little bit out of reach simply because they lost the password. Yeah, there's 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 other brand friendly, you know, chains and, and platforms that are looking to kind of onboard the next you know few million to a billion users, and all the stuff that Kevin and I just kind of rattled off, which it's sort of like beyond 101 in a sense where it's really like you are your own bank. You are setting up your own wallet. You are responsible for those types of things, but it's also like a deterrent for mass, uh, the masses to get into this, right? It's, it's a scary thing for people who even just pay attention to it, who even work in our industry, don't even have their own wallet. Cause they're just like, I don't understand this and, or I don't want to be <laughs> responsible. Like I can barely, you know, put on the right, socks in the morning right so you know there, there's there's other <laughs> things like companies called sweet um they're an nft platform they they will allow you to sign up with an email address and, and they will hold the nft in a wallet that they will control right and then you can eventually push that nft out to a wallet that you will control in the future but the first step of starting your own wallet is really easy it's just by putting an email out there and they they hold it for you so they're a custodian service in a sense you know Dapper Labs, as Kevin mentioned, who who are the the founders of uh, NBA Top Shot, you know they created their own uh, blockchain called Flow, and you know to sign up with Top Shot and to buy the NBA Top Shot NFTs, um, it was easy. I just put up my email address, and that was like one, some of the first NFTs I purchased was through Top Shot, right? You just put in your email address, and they have it in that wallet, and I just I paid with cash, right? Um, and they convert it all to to their own currency as well. So there are platforms out there. You just don't own it per se until you move it out into your own wallet. So um, whenever there's a custodian involved, that someone will always have access to your your funds or to your your assets until you move it out and you own it on yourself. So yeah, so there there are there are midway bridges that will allow people to kind of get involved and test it out, which we highly recommend. But I think like that next jump will be owning it on your own and kind of managing your own security and wallets. So one of the things that you mentioned in your response just a few seconds ago was how brands are kind of finding ways to support NFTs, even though they may not directly be creating an NFT themselves. I mean, you're talking about like the NBA Top Shot being an example. Do you have other examples of how brands are exploring use of NFTs outside of maybe just creating them? Or maybe that is like the main way that they're being active, just trying to get a sense of like how brands can participate in in this conversation from like a holistic perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, Gucci, Gucci is a great example. We can talk about that one. Like Gucci has done collaborations with NFTs already by just sort of having NFT projects and artists kind of create Gucci, um, artwork and the way of wearables for, um, certain NFT projects. So whether it's a board ape or something like that, or, um, cool cats, um, pudgy penguins, whatever it is, they partnered with uh, an NFT project to sort of create little wearables to put on top of them. Um, so it's not like they have to necessarily create their own project, um, but they were associated with really well-known projects already. And it was just really, really smart way to kind of go about it as well. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of different ways that brands are, are doing uh, amazing collaborations. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, I won't say it's a collaboration, but it's it's a new way for brands to create value for their community. It's through a project called Fan Controlled Football, which is essentially like a, a European football league. So it's like a soccer league. But the NFT holders okay. actually are the ones calling the plays for the teams that are playing in real life. Hmm. So this <laughs> is like a league that's set up with, you know, not like the best soccer players, but definitely skillful soccer players. And it's almost democratizing club ownership, which, which I love. And it, it's so hard. If, if you want to own a sports team uh, in, in the U.S., good luck. <laughs> you know, that is a very exclusive club to be a part of. Like, you know, in, in London yeah. and, and in England, you get knighted. And then in the U.S. and in the States, you don't get knighted. You get the right to own a sports club. <laughs> <laughs> right or a team right it's it's that exclusive of a group of people <laughs> uh so the, right. this this idea of like um further empowering community and fans uh with this type of ownership is, is such a a great idea that i think you know other other types of big companies could could look out for and and gain some 
gain some ideas from, right? Like let's use like a fashion brand like Burberry or, or, or Nike as an example. Like maybe they have community voted right. uh, votes for, for different product drops or things like that. Uh, if you hold the NFT, you can, you can design the next mass produced dunk, right? That would be kind of cool. Uh, so there's just so many different ways that you can implement NFTs and voting and community to really like empower that community, but also help drive sales in the process through excitement. So as we wrap up our episode, are there any other perspectives or takeaways that you all would like our listeners to know about NFTs and, and generally how they relate to um, especially digital marketing? Yeah, sure. So when considering NFTs, if we're talking to brands, brands need to explore how they can further reward their most loyal customers and fans. I think we gave a lot of great examples on that before. We also want to educate as many people as possible. Uh, just you know, taking a step back and, and looking at the, the NFT conversation and the metaverse conversation from far away. I think education is key here. Uh, we want to educate uh, not only clients but you know investors on the on the utility of NFTs and how we can move beyond making NFTs a PR moment if we're talking about a brand and how we can focus on, on something more of substance, right? Because of course it will be a PR moment if you activate an NFT at this time, but you do want this to have some, some deeper substance and utility and meaning long-term for your brand to create more value, whether that be through, you know, converting people from customers to advocates and loyalists or just driving sales. Uh, there needs to be a deeper strategy in place. NFTs are more of like a longer term play where I think a common consensus is that it's just like a short term money grab, which there are those projects and, and there are many examples like that, but those, those projects and those examples will not be around in one or two years. I think you're looking at maybe 1% of the projects out there might be around in a few years based on just how many projects are coming to this gold rush right now. Yeah, I'll add on to that too. Kevin pretty much has covered, you know, the basic way to think through it is, you know, if it's beyond a PR stunt, you know, what do you, how do you leverage this technology beyond that and to maybe it's something for like a test out a new business model idea or test out a way to engage with your fans more and just kind of ask yourself, like, what do I have access to that our fans would love? Um, and how do we give them access? And then also, can this be done without blockchain? Because if it can, then just do it without blockchain. You don't necessarily need to use NFTs for that. Such a great point right there. Yeah, we try to shy away from these types of ideas or at least steer our clients into ways that, to think about, okay, cool, if, if you're, if you're hell-bent on trying to use this technology, then let's just make it special that only this technology can do. And then, you know, if it can be done else, elsewhere or through another technology that doesn't use, utilize a blockchain, let's, let's do it there and let's test it out and see if it works. And if it, if it works, perhaps we can iterate on it and, and do it on the blockchain for a future use case. But um, I think the main thing is just center yourself and ground yourself on the, the reason why you want to do this um, as an NFT or if you want to even be using this technology in the first place. Um, and then what's the benefit for your customers uh, if they were to engage with it? So if you kind of sit around those couple questions, I, I think you, it's a good starting point to think about should you be in the space and then what you could be doing. Definitely food for thought. Mike, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your expertise on NFTs. I know I've learned a lot. I've got a lot to think about, even just with the last uh, few statements alone. So again, thank you so much and uh, definitely looking forward to having you guys on again at some point. Thanks for having us. Awesome. Thank you. That brings us to the end of this episode of Digital Marketing Musings. If you have an idea for an episode for our 2022 season, we would love to hear it. Just drop us a note at digitalmarketingmusings at mercalink.com. And of course, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button uh, as well as rate and review us. It helps others find our show and always grateful when uh, you share the show with a friend. This episode was produced by Merkel with sound and video editing by Craig Zagurski. Our team includes copywriting by Onika Shalisman, graphic design by Garrett Rubel, website support by Ted Lonzak, and social media and promotion by Gina Astrop and Andrea Ratner. Tune in next time as we continue our gaming series with a discussion around gaming creative. And until then, I'm Andrea McCartney. And I am Gaia Reed. Bye.